Hello and welcome to another trek through the luxuriant and fascinating jungle that is the thought of one of the greatest philosophers of the 19th century, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. This week on The Philosopher's Zone, we're looking at Hegel's God and at Hegel as a rational mystic. Hi, I'm Alan Saunders. My guest again is Robert Wallace, a philosopher best known for his book Hegel's Philosophy of Reality, Freedom and God, and a man with a keen interest in philosophical mysticism. Bob, welcome back to The Philosopher's Zone. Thank you, Alan. To begin with, liberal theologians during the last century and a half have wanted to articulate a conception of God that would satisfy people's spiritual longings without conflicting with Darwinian evolution and other well-established scientific discoveries. And you believe, don't you, that Hegel had in fact already done that? I do indeed. Um, The issues raised by Darwin... Darwinian um, science are not brand new. So the issue had already all been present in Western consciousness for many centuries of how our animal nature relates to our higher aspirations. Darwin poses that question in a very dramatic way, but it, it was, he, this was not the beginning of the discussion. It had been going on for a long time. And uh, Hegel though he lived before Darwin and did not anticipate Darwin, was very much aware of the underlying issue. And this is what most of his thought is addressed to, in effect. Now, the idea that Hegel has something to do with God has tended very often not to be taken seriously because he was well known as a significant influence on Karl Marx. And Marx, of course, was well known as an atheist. Correct. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, those who on the left, uh, including Marxists, who for some reason consider Hegel's thinking an important source, and I'm never quite sure why they consider it an important source. Uh, Marx claims to treasure something he calls the dialectic, which he thinks he got from Hegel, but I'm not sure why it's important that he got it from Hegel. But nevertheless, there is this desire among progressive people and uh, who consider themselves materialists and atheists, there is uh, often a desire, nevertheless, to extract something of value from Hegel's philosophy. And so there's a long tradition of, of trying to diminish the religious or the, uh, theistic or metaphysical side of Hegel in order to make it plausible that one could extract perhaps the most important or the defensible or the valuable part of Hegel without uh, leaving behind anything essential. Just as a sidebar on the, the subject of the dialectic, you can find this in Greek philosophy. It's, what is it? It's essentially, is it sort of seeking the truth through dialogue? Well, that's, that's the etymology of the word, yes. And that's roughly what it means in Greek discussion. Dialectic is dialogue, or it's the comparison of conflicting positions with one another, um, the effort to extract some kind of truth from the conflict. In Hegel, it has a slightly more specific meaning. Dialectic is the effort to clarify the relationship between finite and infinite phenomena, Freedom, as Hegel understands it, is the effort to go beyond the finite. And so freedom and the spirit and the divine all partake of the infinite in some sense. And consequently, the relationship between the infinite and the finite is a crucial issue for Hegel. And most of his conceptual work is intended to try to clarify that in some fashion. It involves paradox, (laughs) the idea that the infinite is accessible to us finite creatures and involved in us, and that the finite is indeed the infinite essentially needs to include the finite. These are all paradoxical ideas, which Hegel's, what he calls his dialectic, is meant to clarify. Well, let's look at 
Hegel's God. Hegel begins, doesn't he, with a radical criticism of conventional ways of thinking about God. That's right. To what extent these are the ways of thinking characteristic of sophisticated theology is something that ought to be explored. But certainly the standard conventional way of thinking of God is as a being who has certain remarkable qualities, such as omniscience and omnipotence and so forth. And Hegel goes right to the beginning of this definition, let's call it a definition of God, and says, how could God be a being? Because if God were a being, there would be other beings alongside God, presumably many of them much smaller and less glorious and less powerful, but still independent beings existing separate from God, alongside God, as it were. And then, if that were the case, God, Hegel suggests, would be limited because God, this God, would not be the other beings alongside him. And by virtue of not being those things, there would be limits to this God. And if God is meant to be unlimited or infinite, then this God, who's one being among others, has failed to be what he's supposed to be. So God isn't just like us, only bigger and more powerful. He better not be, right, (laughs) or he won't be infinite. But if he isn't a being, what is he? Assuming it makes sense to talk about him as a he. Yes, Oh, we always have these pronoun problems. I often use the pronoun it, but then, of course, we uh, it sounds like we're talking about another kind of a thing without any life or consciousness. That's unfortunate. What is God if God is not a being? This is the question that Hegel's entire metaphysical project is directed at. God, as Hegel understands God, is the process of self-determination and the reality of self-determination in everything, in you and me, in the universe as a whole, to the extent that we succeed in being self-determining, which is Hegel's account of what freedom is, to the extent that we succeed in being free, in being ourselves, by virtue of being self-determining, we are real as ourselves, to the extent that we achieve any of this, we are going beyond the finite, as I said, and we are participating in God. We are contributing to God, or we are instantiating God. In the 17th century, the great philosopher Spinoza talked about Deus siwe natura, God or nature, and basically he thinks that God and nature are the same. It's essentially a pantheistic view. Everything is God. Is that what Hegel's saying here? Well, that would be one way of interpreting what I just said, right? (laughs) However, Hegel's emphasis on going beyond the finite makes it clear that he isn't simply identifying God with everything, all the stuff, material objects, the universe, and nature in that sense. They do not constitute God because they're all finite. No matter how vast they are all, particular things, limited by not being other things, and therefore finite. Whereas the divine is the process of becoming infinite, of not being limited by other things. And so it it is certainly not identical with nature as we ordinarily understand it. He does make what sounds like the rather extraordinary point, that there's a sense in which finite things, like you and me, fail to be as real as possible. What does he mean by that? Well, we are certainly real in the ordinary sense that you can measure us, you can bump into us, all these kinds of reality we do possess. However, Hegel suggests that something that makes itself what it is, rather than being made deserves to be called fully real in a way that things that are made simply by other things aren't. Fully real in the sense that what makes itself what it is is itself in a stronger sense 
than something that's simply the product of other things. So I'm in fact more real at some times than at others Absolutely. when I'm stepping back from myself <laughs> and thinking about what I should be doing, mm-hmm. making myself, mm-hmm. if you like. Mm-hmm. If you're engaging in open-minded thought about either what you should do or what you should believe, to that extent you're being self-determining. You're refusing to simply be told what to do or believe. You're seeking some more rational form of self of deter that um, you're seeking to determine what you will do or believe in a more rational way than simply being an extension of your environment on abc radio national you're with the philosopher's zone and i'm talking to robert m wallace about hegel and hegel's god bob there are two ways of looking at god you can talk about him as being imminent that is he is in some sense in the world informs the world or you can talk about him as being transcendent above the world. Now, from what you've said, I would expect Hegel really to have an imminentist view of God, but you say he goes for transcendence, doesn't he? I would say he does both. (laughs) God is in the world and beyond the world. In the world insofar as he is our you know, we are involved, he is our self-determination, he is the self-determination of finite things. But out of the world, insofar as self-determination takes us beyond being merely finite. So, both at the same time. (laughs) This is the dialectic, Alan. (laughs) It's difficult to understand how there can be a being that's neither identical with us and the world, nor a separate being from us and the world. It's difficult to know even how to talk about it. Indeed, yes. It's a difficulty that is familiar from the the mystics. If you read Meister Eckhart or Jalaluddin Rumi, uh, the great Sufi poet who has become popular in recent years um, in English translation, or any of the other mystical poets, Rilke, Whitman... They all stammer, right, when it comes to expressing the relationship between the divine and the world. But what they want to share with us is the discovery that the divine is in the world, that in some sense it's present everywhere and we can be aware of this presence. So... The mystical poets stammer, and the mystical philosophers stammer too, but they try to stammer in a more coherent way. Yes, I, 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 so, so, so you would actually see, would you, Hegel as having these mystical insights, but being, because he's a philosopher, more systematic about their expression. Exactly. And do you think, uh, you know, I said he had mystical insights. Do you think that he arrives at uh, his conclusions in the way that a mystic would have arrived at them? Or is it all nuts and bolts? Is it all put together by the process of thought? Well, if the process of thought were putting together nuts and bolts, uh, that would not be an accurate description (laughs) at all of, of the process that Hegel went through. But I would, I have to assume that he had significant, what we might call religious experience, and that this extended through his life, and that he tried to clarify this religious experience in relation to, or understand its relation to, his cognitive experience, his thinking. And this is exactly what uh, the, the tradition of philosophical mysticism does. It tries to do the two things at the same time, to experience the world in a different way from the everyday experience, or what we often think is our everyday experience, but without losing track of the connection between the two. And that's what uh, the the thinking, the systematic thinking, um, is trying to clarify. In a moment of mystical insight, St. Augustine described God as 
more inward to me than my most inward part. And in fact, Hegel also, didn't he, drew the conclusion that we can know God more intimately than we can know ourselves. More intimately than we can know the physical world, yes. Not more intimately than we know ourselves, because our, the essential self uh, that we understand or that we know, if we do know it, is, Hegel thinks, an aspect of God. So that to the extent that we know ourselves, we know God and vice versa. Uh, to the extent that we know God, we know ourselves. This kind of knowledge is certainly different from the knowledge that we have of our physical bodies, and the knowledge that we have of, of the other bodies around us in the physical world. It's not clear, though, that Hegel's God has what it has to do with what we think of as God. The God who created the world in seven days sent his son to save us from our sins and will judge us at the end of time. So rather than using the name God for Hegel's fullest reality. Why shouldn't we talk about the absolute or the ground of being, which wouldn't imply any particular connection with traditional religion? Yes, well, this has been suggested by uh, critics of the what they call the philosopher's God repeatedly, that it's not really God, and we shouldn't use that word. Hegel answers this in numerous ways. First of all, by showing how this process of self-determination that I've been um, describing is not by any means merely intellectual. It is intellectual in an important way, but it's also very emotional. That is, it involves the emotions in principle and in many ways. This is a, this is a connection that Plato um, made explicit long before and which uh, Hegel inherits. Uh, Plato is a philosopher of freedom and reason, and most people know Plato is a philosopher of love, and he sees no dividing line between those, um, so that his uh, exploration of, of love is an exploration of its relation to reason and vice versa. He, he believes that a fully free person will necessarily, by virtue of that freedom, engage with the people around them in a loving way. This is the, the doctrine of Plato's Symposium, um, Diotima's speech, that um, the, the, uh, the philosopher um, or anyone who seeks freedom and loves the good will seek to share that love and that freedom with everyone whom they come into contact with. That's the process that uh, Diotima calls giving birth, and uh, in giving birth in beauty. And, and Socrates is famous for his midwife activity. Well, this is, this is, this is Socrates' way of enacting love. Hegel takes for granted that this, uh, this inseparability of freedom and love and indeed, he doesn't only take it for granted, he tries to demonstrate it, uh, why it's necessary. Um, and that's the uh, overarching argument of his great book, The Science of Logic, is that is uh, aimed at the final conclusion that we are in each other, we are involved in each other. So our individual freedom is something necessarily and appropriately uh, shared with one another. Individuality is inseparable from sharing. So, the upshot of this is that what might sound like a highly intellectual, and perhaps in that sense, arid exercise, I mean, Hegel obviously is, is in, you know, using intellectual means to the max. What might sound like a purely intellectual exercise is in fact a very emotional exercise. It's just as much about love, it's just, about the, just as much about the emotions as it is about the intellect. This may be news to uh, many people, <laughs> but there's a, a great line in, in um, the final section of Hegel's Logic where he describes what he calls the concept, 
which is the intellectual structure of the world, of, the, of reality, the concept is boundless love and bliss. Yes. So this is not often quoted by those who think that Hegel is, Hegel is um, dry and arid. <laughs> Uh, what about us? Uh, the traditional God destines us for eternal happiness or eternal damnation. Does Hegel's God get up to that sort of thing? Well, Hegel's God is very much involved in us, right? He's not out there pulling strings. <laughs> he is, he, she, it is a process of which we are necessary parts. So rather than judging our souls after our death... God is constantly judging us, and we are judging ourselves, and that process, these, these phenomena are really indistinguishable. Uh, insofar as we orient ourselves towards the reality and participate in the reality that I've been trying to describe, which is both free and loving, we are ourselves as real as we could possibly be. We are experience, the love and the bliss that I just quoted from Hegel's logic. This is Hegel's account of what salvation would be. Insofar as we fail to appreciate and participate in these things, we fail to be as fully real as we conceivably might have been and this is our punishment and, imposed on us by ourselves. <laughs> and these rewards and punishments are this worldly, however. They are in our experience, which is uh, the reality of the reality that religion is about, Hegel wants us to think. And, and so his point is that the true topic of religion is not a separate life after life, after death. It's this life. But that is not to say that the true topic of religion is, is simply eating and drinking and sex and rock and roll. It includes those and it goes beyond those. Um, and that's the message that the mystical poets have been sharing with us um, all along, and Hegel shares it. I mean, it's just the same message that Hegel is articulating. So... To return to your question of what what is Hegel saying, uh, why why is it appropriate to use the the name of God for the reality that Hegel has described? If the name of God is appropriately or necessarily tied to something other than us and other than our world and other than our experience then it should not be applied to what Hegel's describing. But traditionally, the claim made for God is that God is infinite. And this is, of course, the, the crucial qual characteristic that Hegel is not going to abandon. And his complaint about the conventional conceptions of God as other than us and other than the world is that they prevent God from being infinite. And so a truly infinite God will be involved with us in the ways that Hegel's been describing and will not any longer be a merely finite manipulator of these other finite things that supposedly survive after our death. Well, Bob Wallace, we've emerged from the intellectual jungle and I think we can now see the light. Thank you very much for being our guide. Thank you, Alan. Been a pleasure. For more Hegelian guidance from Robert Wallace, have a look at his website. You'll find a link to it on our website at abc.net.au slash rn slash philosopher's zone, which is also where you go if you want to post a comment on this week's show. The Philosopher's Zone is produced by Kyla Slavin with Charlie McCune as sound engineer. I'm Alan Saunders. And I'll be back next week.